Well, praise God, good to be back again teaching. And uh, I just wasn't really sure when you come back from a trip what to teach on, but uh, just uh, this last night I was just thinking about uh, the law of God. You know, don't worry, I'm not going to put us under the law. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot to be gleaned from the uh, what's called the, the Ten Commandments, a lot of, lot of wisdom. And I'm going to maybe just, the Lord wills, maybe over the <laughs> next few weeks, just look at the, the God's law, especially the, the Ten Commandments, and just what we can glean from that. Uh, because really, uh, these Ten Commandments really, you could say, are the, the foundation of really morality and in society, really, and throughout the world, really. Uh, there's much in common with, with, with what these commandments say. And somebody might say, well, why study the law? We're no longer under the law. We're, we're now under grace. And that is true. But uh, grace is given to help us to keep the law. And God is still a God. Of law, he's a god of of standards. He, he he always has been and always will be. Yeah, because God is a is a moral being and he has things which please him, things which displease him. That's been true from eternity. It'll be true <laughs> evermore. So there's always uh, because God is moral. There's always going to be right and wrong and standards and God gives us grace not just God gives us grace that we can uh, please him that we can please him and actually desire to please him because that's what we find what we find actually in the new covenant is God actually puts his law in our hearts so it's not like a a burdensome thing to to serve God and to to please God so this is really the reality. Uh, really, the law reveals God's will. It reveals his nature. And it also reveals his wisdom. And even though we're no longer under Old Testament times, you find that the, the, law, the law of God, even the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, are they're still relevant to our life and, and the Holy Spirit helps us to uh, to have go, to interpret these things for our situation and our context even though we're not under that old covenant Israel nation of God we're not under that system uh, the Spirit gives us wisdom to apply that system in the situations that we are faced in our modern life and that is always the case and you have examples of it even in the New Testament for example if you look at the Apostle Paul he was writing to to Timothy and he talks about uh, that a person who labours in the scriptures ought to receive a financial reward you know, especially somebody that's doing it for a living you know, he ought to, you know, those that labour in Scripture, uh, and that's their, and that's their, their, their living especially, they, they, they should be uh, rewarded for that labour. And then he quotes out of the law, he says that you shall not muzzle the ox that treads the corn. <laughs> you know, and he takes something out of the law, which is completely, in the law that was like concerning the ox, that was about how to treat the ox. But then Paul applies the principle, a totally different situation. And that's an example how the Holy Spirit can use the wisdom of the law in your situation. So even though we're not under the law, there's great wisdom in the law. You know, people say, well, you know, I shouldn't tithe. We don't have to tithe. We're not under the law today. We don't need to tithe. But, you know, it's, there's wisdom under that principle of giving. You know, it's like there's, there's a blessing in it. There's more blessed to give 
than to receive. So there is uh, reasons for, for stuttering the law. Especially today, because we live in a society where there's like, in many cases, there's a, there's a moral vacuum where people have turned from, from God and from the idea of, uh, of an external uh, st set of standards that we are obligated to keep. We live in a society now where it's a bit like the days of judges where everybody is doing what's right in their own eyes. We live, people use the term like relativism where everything's just relative to you and you can be your own God, you can uh, design your own morality and your own standards and it's just about whatever is right for you. And that's why we need to know that there is a God in heaven and there is an objective standard which he uh, holds all people to so we need to, these things are, are important we also live in a, a scientific generation where people sometimes think that that, that science is the be all and end all of truth that all, everything that we, we need in life we can get from science that also is is false because although I you know I, I I myself enjoy science I think science is wonderful but science has its limitations mm. yeah. science can't can't especially in the area of law and morality that's where science is kind of like that's out of its realm and science deals with with facts and, and what is but it can't deal with what ought. There's a difference between is and ought. You could say this morning that I, it's a scientific fact that I am here this morning in Enniskillen. You can see me, you can hear me, you can observe, and if you were a scientist, you, you, you can prove scientifically that I am here in Enniskillen this morning. But if I said, you know, should I be in Anaskillen this morning? Ought I be in Anaskillen? Then you're, diff you're dealing in a different realm. <laughs> you're going way beyond science. You're going into the realm of, of, of morality, of law, of duty, principle. You know, and uh, you know, should I be here? I believe I sh should be here because the Bible says that I should not forsake assembling together and I. Like the fellowship of you wonderful people in Anaskillen, Tobago. Mm -hmm. I uh, believe I should be here because I believe God's given me uh, a gift that I can that I can <laughs> bless people with, and I can also receive gifts from other people. And there's many reasons why I should be here. And I always feel refreshed and blessed when I come here and leave here. Praise God! And uh, but there may be a situation where I have a family emergency, and then not it could be a situation where I ought not to be here. It doesn't happen very often, thankfully, but sometimes something can happen where I, it might be better for me not to be here. But that's, these are ethical questions to do with principles and duty and, and law and such things. And uh, so there is a difference. I think it was Einstein that said you can talk about uh, the ethics of science, but you can't talk about the science of ethics. <laughs> Praise God, so what you can th think about that one. You know. um, yeah, but uh, anyway, this is uh, so law is important. It's, not, it's, not, it's just good to know, really. And when you go through the Ten Commandments, you know, it, it comes across maybe as a bit, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not. But when we look into it from the, you know, especially from the perspective of New Testament and the wisdom of the Spirit, we, we actually see it's good just to see what God says about our life. You know what God says about what is God's standards about about marriage, about about uh, integrity, about how we conduct our business, how we conduct our employment, you know how we worship Him. You know the, the law has a lot of wisdom, and uh, it's good to come in and just glean from that, and it'll be good, you know and. So I want to just look this morning briefly just at, a, at an introduction again of, of law in, in general. 
Because, you know, law is something which affects all of us, it affects all of life. And, you, and, we, and the, the Bible actually tells us that God has put the uh, awareness of, of his law in the hearts of every man. In Romans chapter 2, uh, Paul is talking about, he's given really a, a logical uh, argument of the gospel. And he begins in the book of Romans by by saying by showing how that all men are under sin both jew and gentile the jews had the, the external law of moses but they failed to keep the law you know and the bible says if you don't keep the law perfectly you broke the law you're a sinner and they failed to keep the law that they had but the Gentiles also that didn't have the law, they were also not without excuse because they had the law in their hearts, or at least they had the, the work of the law in their hearts. In other words, God has put within every man what we call a conscience, which is a knowledge of right and wrong. We all have a moral compass. You can go out into the jungles of Borneo or somewhere and somebody has never heard, never read the Bible, never heard a preacher, but they know that you shouldn't steal, that you shouldn't uh, commit adultery with your neighbour's wife, that you shouldn't uh, murder somebody, that you shouldn't deceive people and lie to people. People intrinsically know that that, 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 there, that there is that there is wrong that certain things are right certain things are wrong and, and Paul brings us out Paul says in Romans chapter 2 that that uh, verse uh, 13 or verse 14 he says for the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law these having not the law are a law unto themselves in other words, they don't have the physical law of Moses, but they have they have their own principle of law within, and they use it to govern their communities, to govern their societies. And it says in verse fifteen, which which show the the work of the law written in their hearts. Paul is not saying here that all men have the nature of the law, but they have the the work or the the principle of right and wrong. God has written it in their hearts their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts that mean accusing or or else excusing one another and people are constantly doing that with themselves and with other people they are excusing or they are accusing man is a he's a moral being you know so it's makes it one of the things that makes him distinct from from animals he is a, a moral creature and he, he, has, he lives by the principles of law. He, he knows what is right and what is wrong. If you don't believe me, after church, you can go into a restaurant and steal somebody's lunch, take somebody's, grab somebody's burger, and start eating it. And what do they turn around and do? They turn around, what are you doing? You know, you're not meant, you shouldn't do that. You know, you're being a thief, you should buy, you know, people know what is right and what is wrong. And uh, we are moral beings and we, we judge people, we judge ourselves. And even Paul warns us because he says that, you know, whenever you're judging people, be, be careful because you can, you know, you're actually revealing, you know, your own understanding of what's right and wrong. And you, and you behind the kind kind of yourself. But uh, people just, people are, we're, we're moral beings. That's why people, when, there, when there's injustice in society, people will... They'll, they'll march, they'll hold placards, they'll create movements. Somebody gets beaten up because of their colour of skin, then they'll create like mm-hmm. movements like you know, Black Lives Matter and things like that. And different movements are created and people go out and strike because they're not getting proper wages. And there's all kinds of things that people do because when they feel that they're they're they feel injustice, they feel they're being violated. 
So again, we are moral beings. And uh, Paul says really that the, our understanding of law, both Jew and Gentile, means, he says in chapter 3, verse 9, that, that both Jews and Gentiles that were all under sin. We've all broken the law of our conscience. You ever, you know, you ever had that kind of feeling where you, you do something, you have it you know, throughout life, you, you do something, you say something, and you just know inside, you know what? I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't have done that. You, you, do, you do something and you just don't, you feel something inside, just, 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 I know this is not right, but you do it anyway. But you, afterwards you feel, you feel guilt. That's your conscience. That's that moral compass that God has put inside you. Everybody has it. Now it can be seared and it can be defiled and all that, but everybody has a conscience and uh, everybody has a knowledge of right and wrong and that's what makes everybody accountable before God mm. and we've all broken God's laws we're all under sin but of course then the good news Paul lays his foundation to reveal the good news is that is that Christ is the saviour for all men both Jew and Gentile we can trust in him we can be forgiven and we can be <laughs> saved from our condition What's the background here in, in Romans? Praise God. But, but law is part of society. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he, he also t- talks about law. And he talks about people in verse 7. They, they desired to be teachers of the law, but they didn't understand what they were saying. But he says the law is good if a man use it lawfully. So the law is a the law is a good thing. Even today we can say the law is good if it's used properly. But it can be used wrongfully. There's a lot of places you can go to where the law is used wrongfully. It's used to bring guilt. It's used to manipulate. It's used to uh, control people. To abuse people. And the, the law can be used wrongfully and people can use guilt and condemnation mm. to to control manipulate we see that today we see it throughout church history like we've given the different examples of it but for, for time's sake i'd probably better not but but he says uh, knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous man so in other words if you were a perfectly righteous person you know if you're nature and is to always do right then you don't really need an external law mm-hmm. but it's made for the for the laws for the disobedient for the ungodly for sinners for unholy for profane for murderers for fathers murderers of mothers whoremongers those that fight themselves with mankind men stealers liars perjured persons and for any other thing which is not contrary to sound doctrine so paul has a whole list of things here and Basically saying that that the law really makes because of law uh, sinners really they don't have you can't you can't get off the hook you know God has revealed his law and it makes us guilty but there's also a sense where where law is also in in society there, there's a use of the law even in secular society where it might not be the exact Ten Commandments but there's certain there's a certain overlap where a lot of the Moral principles of God are are employed in, in society and it's used to bring uh, order and justice and protection. You know, thankfully we live in a society where there's laws regarding theft, there's laws regarding uh, violence and abuse and punishment of or, or, or uh, people being oppressed. There's laws that govern theft and all kinds of things and that brings like a, a protection to society it brings order you often hear the term law on order you know, and without law there's no order you know, law brings order and we need law in all of society because of our well, largely because of our sinful nature and, and law is used to kind of like restrain it to stop it from getting out of out of hand you live in a a lawless society it's just people are running rampant and 
some countries are like that. They just there's a breakdown of government and there's a breakdown of law and order and people are just going around doing what they want and it creates chaos. God has given God has put law there to to guard and uh, to protect and we have it in, in government, you have it in the corporate world or in the business world. You need certain laws. You can't just go in and do what you want in the workplace. You know, or you get you get fired or whatever it is or get a warning. Or, uh, but they, that's just law. There's laws in, in the home. There's laws in, in, in the church. We need to have a certain amount of, of law to govern how we do things. There's law even in sport. You're playing football and you, you hit the guy with an elbow in your face. You can end up getting sent off. Or, or the, maybe a penalty kick, penalty kick is awarded against you. Those laws govern, govern that. So that's really, well, I want to look, you know, just briefly then at the, at the law of Moses. And Paul talks it in, about it in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, the law of Moses. When he asks the question here, he talks about it in verse 19. He says, now what serves the law? Why did God give the law? To, to Israel. And we all know the story how that God brought the Israelites out of uh, Egypt. He brought them into the, the wilderness. And then we have the, the Mount Sinai, the, the earthquakes and the fire and the thunder. And uh, God gives the law then to, to Moses. And that law was then given to, to govern those people, govern that nation. But why did God do this? Because God had given Abraham promise of you know of salvation through his seed and what served what was the purpose of the law? And some people would think that under the Old Testament people were were saved by keeping the law of Moses. But under the New Testament people are saved by believing in Christ. That is actually uh, not true, it's not really accurate because the reality of it was that, that nobody actually was able to keep the law of Moses. You know, nobody was even look at the Ten Commandments and the, the very last one, the tenth one is that you shall not covet. Mm. I don't know about you, but I've certainly coveted. I think probably everybody has, has in some way coveted what somebody else has or has wanted what somebody else has. has. That's a sin of the heart. And really, uh, Jesus says the law is, 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 is summed up in, in, in loving God with all your heart, soul and strength, loving your neighbour as yourself. And many people have done that perfectly. <laughs> you know, there's, there's laws of, commit, of, of committing sin and there's laws of what they call laws of omission, where you actually don't do what you should do. So sin is not just what you do wrong, but it's what you don't do right. So it's really, when you really bring bring it down to the to to the, and, and study the law, nobody has been able to keep the law. Jesus says, if you look at somebody to lust after them, you commit sin in your heart. You know, it's like you, nobody's ever been able to keep the law perfectly. And the problem is that when you break one part of the law, you've broken the law. You've broken all of it. You've broken. You know, it's even if you just so it's the same in, 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 in civil law. If I go out and uh, drive my car and I, I'm, I'm speeding in a 30 mile an hour zone, not that I would ever do that, like, but just as an example. <laughs> you know, but uh, speeding in a 30 mile an hour zone, the policeman catches you with his camera and he says, you know, you have broken the law. I could turn around and say, well, look, well, I, pay, I pay my taxes. You know, he says, no, but you've broken the law concerning speed. And well, you know, I, I don't, I haven't done any violence. I haven't, you know, I'm a good law-abiding citizen. I, he says, I don't care, you've broken the law. And you're going to receive your penalty points or whatever. You know, when you break the law in one area, you break the law completely. You know, it's like throwing a stone at a window. You know, it's like, you might put, that, that one stone breaks a window even if it's only a hole in one area. 
So I mean, again, that's, that's the way the law is. And nobody could keep the law. So even under the old covenant, people were not saved because they perfectly kept the law. They were saved because they put their faith and trust in God and they looked towards the, the Christ, the Messiah, who would come. That's why the Bible says that the Bible says that Abraham was just Abraham believed God and righteousness was imputed to him. And and David said also, David says, No blessed is the man who the, the God doesn't uh, impute sin. Even David realized that that uh, salvation is by faith. And the old covenant believer, he would see his sin, he would see that he would he would be have this law and he would realize that he can't keep the law perfectly and he would look to God for mercy and that mercy would be seen through the it was it was seen through the sacrificial system where God says instead of you having to pay the penalty and, and die for your sin put that blood put that death put that sin upon an animal and his blood would temporarily cover over sin so every week, every month, and even every year, it would be a continual blood sacrifice or a, a reminder that, that's, that, that you're a sinner, you have violated God's holy law, you deserve to die. God in his mercy it puts that, that the death upon an animal. And that would go on year after year until finally then God, then Jesus came along and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was that final mm -hmm. sacrifice under the law who could bring salvation forever. And he could, the Bible says that he was able to cleanse the conscience of sin. Mm -hmm. As the Bible says again in Hebrews that if you offered an animal, you, you still had that, that conscience of sin. It didn't really take away a sin from your heart, from your conscience. But the blood of Jesus was able to take sin away completely. And now you come boldly into the presence of God. Amen. So he says in verse 19, you know what? What service the law it was added because of transgressions? Till the seed should come. That's talking about Christ. Till, till the promised seed should come. Uh, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So the law was added because of transgressions. In other words, what Paul says here and elsewhere is the law was actually given uh, not to, <coughs> it was actually given to, to magnify sin. Because it, well, there's no law, even though people are sinning, well, there's no law that, that sin is not really, it's there, but it's not really being exposed. But once you create a law that says, don't do this, don't do that, you shall not do that, then all of a sudden that sin is then brought to the fore. It is, it is revealed, it is, it is magnified. And, and the law actually magnified sin and it made people more aware of their, of, that they were sinners. It says in verse 20, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law against the promise of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given where, where, where we could have life, there, therefore righteousness would have been came by the law. Yes. See, the law couldn't give life. It wasn't because there was a, a deficiency in the law. The, the law was perfect. It was the law of God. <laughs> and it was a perfect law. But the problem was man. The problem was our hearts. And that we were not able to keep the law the law was righteous and holy and good but we were not able to keep the law therefore the law couldn't, couldn't save us that's why the scripture has concluded all are under sin all are under sin can't keep the law therefore the only way is is the promise of faith in jesus christ that there was a belief but before Christ came, before faith in Christ came, we were kept mm -hmm. under the law. He says we were shut up 
unto the faith of the Judah, the words be revealed. So in other words, Paul is saying here that the Israelite he was he was boxed into this law which brought condemnation, which brought guilt, which made him just he was weighed in under this law and he was kept in, locked in under it until Christ would come and he would see that that he is the answer. Not every Jew did, but <laughs> that was the that was the idea. And it says in verse twenty four Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we could be justified by faith. I like that term, uh, schoolmaster. It's actually uh, in the Greek the word pedia, pediagogos or something, or pediagogos, I think that's the right pronunciation. Probably not, but, <laughs> but it means basically uh, a a, a, an instructor of children. And in Greek culture, what you did is you, you if you there was like you, you give your children over to like a, a servant or a slave, and he would his job was to instruct them. He would bring them to school that they would be trained. And Paul is saying here that the law is our schoolmaster. It was given to train people to instruct them to bring them to Christ. And again, what did the law teach? The law taught really basically. Three things in my summary is that God is holy, righteous, moral, perfect. It taught that I am not because I would try to keep the law. I would fail. And the law taught me that I am a sinner, that I am that I break the law, that I have failed, that I deserve God's punishment and, and uh, I deserve death really and then uh, the law also taught mercy because then I could put that I could there was a place where I could have that sin atoned for and covered over I could go to the, the priest I could come with my turtle dove or my lamb or bullock whatever it was I could go to the priest and I could have an offering made which could cover over my sin and I could look on to God for for mercy. And these things were like this, this these were this was like a graphic uh, lesson, like a school lesson that was preparing me for Christ and for the cross, for God's plan to, to put Christ on the cross to be a final offering for sin. And that's why the the discerning Jew, by the grace of God, would would, would, have, would was able to see again the reason for the cross. I mean, many stumbled over Christ, but 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 there were some who did see it for what it was. You know, and it was all there. That's why Paul said, Paul even said to Timothy, he says that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make your ways onto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And, was, and he was talking about the Old Testament scriptures. He didn't at that time, Timothy didn't have the New Testament, it wasn't yet formulated. Paul, he only had the old covenant and scriptures, and he says that you, these scriptures are able to make you wise on the salvation. This system was able to reveal Christ. And he says again that after Christ has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster, under that under child trainer. We are now all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And that word children actually means mature sons. We're now, we now have graduated from childhood, from the, from the, the, the law which was like a, a child, like a child teacher. We now have that. We've now graduated into God's family. We are adopted as sons into his family. And we now, uh, we now can walk in a greater way in, in wisdom. Romans chapter 10, also, Paul also talks about the fact that Christ is the end of the law. Praise God. He says here again, see, despite the fact that God gave the law to Israel, many of them weren't able to discern 
the reason and purpose for the law. That's why Paul was saying in Romans chapter 10 verse 1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So many didn't discern really that God's knowledge, they had a zeal. And you know, it's good to be zealous. There are many people today, and you know, it's good to have zeal. But you always, you always need to have zeal tampered with knowledge. You know? Zeal on its own can never really be enough. You, know, you can have zeal and you can you know, fly an airplane into a building. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's zeal, that's religious zeal, but it's, it's not, not, not according to knowledge. And you can have, often, you know, use the illustration of a, a fly in a window, you know, a blue bottle, you see a blue bottle in a window. You know, there's a lot of energy, a lot of zeal. It doesn't really go anywhere. You know, it needs direction. You can have zeal, but not, not have any knowledge. And they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They were going about trying to establish their own righteousness. That's even true today. Many Jews still are still trying to trust in their own good works and the law of Moses and the Talmud and all this all these works of all these all this performance. They were trying to establish their own righteousness. That's also true in a lot of churches as well. So it's true in this country, people go thinking because they're going to church that they help old ladies cross the road, that they give money to uh, whatever it is, Oxfam or whatever, you know, they think that they're doing these charitable deeds that somehow that that's going to you know, earn them right standing before God. And of course that's not true because the reality of it is we're all sinners. You know, even if you don't rob banks and beat people up, you know, you're still a sinner. You may be a, may, may be a less outwardly demonstrative sinner, but you're still a sinner. We all need God's mercy. And it says in verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness for everyone that believes. Christ is the end of the law. And that word end, is, the Greek word is, Telos, and it means the, 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 the goal or the purpose. Christ is the, the goal or the purpose of the law of righteousness. In other words, the law was designed to bring us to Christ. It was like a signpost. It's like being on this journey. I come this morning from, from Lurgan to Enniskillen. Once I arrive in Enniskillen, then I come to the, the end of the journey. I don't have to go, go be any longer on that road. If I arrive at my destination, praise God, and Christ is like the end of the journey. It's like the law was like a shadow, and Christ is the reality. The law is like a type, and Christ is the fulfillment. The law had the promise. And Christ fulfills that promise. Praise God. Amen. So that's why it's good again to know that you know, we're, today we're, we're not under the law. You know, all these things regarding what you should wear, what you should eat, what you should, you know, we're, we're not under these, these laws anymore. But yet, that doesn't mean that a new covenant believer is is lawless because the Bible also then tells us that God has actually put his law in our hearts. God has God actually, this is what happens in salvation, in regeneration where a man becomes a new creation. God actually writes his law within, he puts his spirit inside us. This is what Jeremiah uh, prophesied about, I'm not turned to it, but Jeremiah's talked about a time uh, in the future, talked about the new covenant that he'd make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Uh, done according to the old covenant when he brought them out of Egypt. But he says that after these days, he says, says that I will put my law in their inner parts and I will write it 
on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. Both Jeremiah and also Ezekiel, if you're looking at reference, Jeremiah 31, verse 31 and 30. <clears throat> but both Je Jeremiah and Ezekiel talked about a day when God would actually write his law on our hearts. Not just the work of the law. You know, every, person, every, every human being has, has a conscience, mm -hmm. has the, the knowledge of right and wrong. But God actually, when it comes to the New Testament, when it comes to the New Covenant, believer, God actually puts the very nature of the law in our hearts. In fact, Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, he says, and we're in Romans, just, just, just look at that one, he says, Romans 5, verse 5, he says, for hope makes not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. Paul says here that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And God is love. And God is summed up in 1 John. It says God is love. That defines his nature. So therefore we have within us the love of God, which is the divine nature. He's been put in our hearts through the, the Holy Spirit. And when we walk in that love, then we fulfill the law. We actually, we actually fulfill the law by walking in love. Paul said in Romans 13, he talked about the different laws. And he said, uh, verse 8, that don't owe any man anything but to love one another. For he that loves one another has fulfilled the law. You love one another, you fulfill the law. For for this, and he mentions it, he says, You will not commit adultery, you will not kill, you will not steal, you will not bear false witness, you will not covet. And if there are any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, You will love your neighbor mm -hmm. as yourself. <clears throat> love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And so that's really again uh, and we have that love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. so again when we walk in the Spirit when we walk in, in, in love we actually fulfill the law yes. mm -hmm. in fact the whole Ten Commandments can be summed up really Jesus says if you love God with all your heart, soul and strength love your neighbour as yourself that fulfills, that's the whole law and prophets yes. and that can fulfills all of the commandments of regarding keeping the Sabbath day and regarding not saying God's name in vain and all these things. Mm -hmm. And all it's all fulfilled in in love. Love for God and love for our neighbours. Love for each other. Your neighbour really involves anybody in your proximity. You know, it involves any everybody that you, that's involved in your life. Not all neighbours are equally lovable. Praise God. Some neighbours are more easier to love than others. Yeah. But uh, praise God. We're called to love our neighbour. And that fulfills it. Mm -hmm. Amen. But again, because we, because we, we, because of our flesh, we don't do this perfectly. None of us are loving perfectly. We still have flesh. That's why we need to be reminded. That's why even all these uh, commandments, if you look at the Ten Commandments, you'll, you'll actually find that the most of them are actually mentioned again in the New Testament. You know, it talks about, you know, don't steal but give to him that needs. It talks about, you know, don't be committing adultery, but love your wife, and uh, don't be speaking falsehood, speak the truth in love. So th these things are still repeated because we have flesh. And that's why even though we have that grace, we still need to, it's still good to study these things in, in detail mm -hmm. and uh, be, be reminded of them. But thank God that God has put the principle of law within us. And that's why John says, uh, uh, I'll, I'll close with this, in 1 John chapter 5, John says that 
God's commandments are no longer grievous. First John 5, he says, uh, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is, has been born of God. Everyone that loves him that begots loves also him that's begotten of him. But, but thus we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. The reason they're not grievous is because first of all we are born of God. We've got his nature inside us and we overcome the world through our faith. But his commandments are not grievous. And he's really contrasting really what happened with the old covenant people because the Bible says that whenever God spoke the law on Mount Sinai, it says in the book of Hebrews, the people couldn't endure what was spoken. It says, you know, we don't want to hear. They couldn't endure. They didn't want to keep the law. In fact, whenever Moses delayed, they, they, they created like a golden calf. And it says, we'll make this our God. And we'll just have a party and do all the stuff that we're doing. And they said, that this will be our, we'll call this the God that brought us out of Egypt. They really wanted to define God in their own, according to their flesh. And that's really what, that heathenism, we look at all those Roman gods, Greek gods, you know, they're all gods of, of sensuality. If you, went, if, you, if you were an ancient priest, you were, you were going to worship your God. It, it involved having a having an orgy or having a having a party and getting drunk and you know having prostitutes, or whatever it was. You know, it, that's how they worshipped their gods. They were gods of the, that suited their flesh. They weren't holy gods. God, the God of Israel, is uniquely the God that is that is holy. And uh, that's why people don't like people in the world. They don't. They they they. they they run from this God because they don't like, they think that he's going to put a restraint upon their, their joy and their freedom and their life. But the reality of it is that God actually sets you free. You know, sin actually leads to, to bondage, even though it might have pleasure, it leads to death and bondage. But, but God, when he puts his law in your heart, he gives you the freedom. And the greatest freedom in, in life, and this is my... Closing statement, the greatest, the greatest freedom really is to, to do what is right and actually to, to want to do what is right. When you, when you actually want to do the right thing and it is the right thing, <laughs> that is the greatest uh, freedom. When you, when you want to please God and you can please God by his grace and power, that is true liberty and true freedom. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.